Church, we are in our new series after Easter on the Gospel of John. We have an adorable picture that me and AI made together. Uh, Very excited about it. The Gospel of John is this fascinating book. And before we get going into it, I actually want to show, hi, buddy, a clip from The Chosen. Not actually a show I've seen, uh, but I found this clip trying to find a balance of showing what John is doing here. And I like it. So enjoy this, and then we're going to dive back in. Begin. Do you have a favorite passage from the first five? Um, do you? I don't know. I like them all. (laughs) You don't say. (laughs) I suppose I I love the beginning. Mm. I love how God simply spoke and, and the world came into being. Yes. As David wrote, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. You know, the Greeks use word to describe divine reason, what gives the world form and meaning. I like that. (laughs) And it is a favorite memory. A reading from the first scroll of Moses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the Word. And the earth was void and without form. And the Word was with God. And the darkness covered the face of the deep. And the word was God. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I like the book of John. Ooh, that was a good spill. Um, Pope Gregory the Great in the sixth century said the book of John is a, like a pool deep enough for elephants to swim but shallow enough for children to wade, hence our adorable image. Uh, it is a book that has done a lot for our understanding of who Jesus is. It is called like John's Gospel, and then there are the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all preach from the same eye, Synoptic, and John offers this other perspective, almost second or separate completely from them. Uh, Many scholars would say that John may actually be the first gospel written, but the last gospel published. So it has this benefit of not sitting on the shoulders of the other three and coming late enough to write corrections to things that they're seeing in the early church. The gospel does a lot of different things. It is the only proof that we have that Jesus's ministry lasted three years. Jesus goes to the temple for Passover three different times in the gospel of John. In none of the other Gospels does that happen. So we know the length of Jesus' ministry or our guess about it because of John. Uh, In many ways, it gives us this new perspective on the Last Supper. Only the Gospel of John contains the foot washing. And only the Gospel of John contains the restoration of Peter and the picture of John living a long life alone on an island. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what is happening, kiddo? Uh, but before we really go any further into what that is, I want to start with the prologue to John. That's where we're going to spend the lion's share of our time on today. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything came into being through the Word, and without the Word, nothing came into being. What came into being through the Word was life, and that life was the light for all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't extinguish the light. 
A man named John was sent from God. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him everyone would believe in the light. He himself wasn't the light, but his mission was to testify concerning the light. The true light that shines in all people was coming into the world. I'm sorry, the screen is moving so much. Uh, the light was in the world, and the world came into being through the light, but the, light, the world didn't recognize the light. The light came to his own people, and his own people didn't welcome him. But those who did welcome him, those who believed in his name, he authorized to become God's children, born not from blood nor of human desire or passion, but born from God. The word became flesh and made his home among us. We have seen his glory, the glory like that of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. John testified about him, crying out, saying, This is the one whom I said, He who comes after me is greater than me because he existed before me. From his fullness we have received all we have all received grace upon grace. As the law was given through Moses, so grace and truth came into being through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, God's one and only Son, who is at the Father's side, has made God known. It's a beautiful poem. A lot is going on in it. There's a lot of layers in the prologue to the Gospel of John. We have this whole concept that we saw briefly touched on in the video that the Lagos is this Greco-Roman concept of the cog like pre-existent knowledge of all things. The Lagos is what makes all things come into being. It's the like thing that gives shape to platonic forms. It is the reality that comes before everything. And so when John points back to this Greco-Roman term and says, the Lagos, the Greeks in the audience and the Romans in the audience go, huh? What is that doing in a Jewish synagogue? Uh, and then he puts forward into this, the word was with God. Hey, kiddo, let me finish this, okay? Just like 20 more minutes. Uh, and then he's also at the same time doing this bouncing back and forth between Genesis and John. We know that in the beginning, God was over the waters and over the chaos, and yet somehow in some way in the beginning was Christ and Christ was there and Christ was present and everything happened through Christ and that Christ brings light into dark places. What I love about the book of John is clearer than any of the other gospels, John tells us the whole point of why he wrote this book. He says it in John 20. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll, but these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's son and that believing you will have life in his name. So John says, hey, the reason I wrote this book is so you will believe that Jesus is God's son. John is going to use signs throughout the whole Bible instead of miracles because they are signs of who Jesus is, and so that believing in him, you will have life. In John, we hear of this John 10.10, you will have life and have it abundantly. So what's going on in this monologue that helps us believe in Christ and experience eternal life? We know a lot of things about what John is trying to do by just the way he frames it. He's trying to appeal to Greek audiences. He's trying to appeal to Jewish audiences. He's rewriting the Genesis creation account with Jesus at the center of it. And within that, it tells us a whole bunch of things. Jesus, this dude who was born when we all know it, because John is like, you know, contemporary to Jesus. He was born, yet he was actually pre-existent to everything. He was here in creation. In terms of belief, that means that Jesus is a higher level deity than any other deity that I, as a Jew, have ever talked about. Beyond that, Whoa, Noah William. might be the most complicated sermon I've gotten to preach with Noah. Uh, beyond that, God comes in the form of Jesus as a tabernacle. The tabernacle is the story from Exodus, the name of the tent that uh, was with Moses and the Israelites. We're just going to lean into it. It's fine. It'll be a memorable sermon someday. Um, not for the content, obviously. Uh, but that tabernacle that was with Israel in the wilderness somehow is the person of Jesus with Israel in their Roman occupation, in the empire, in there with them, in all things. You know, it's the, the incarnation. My Bible professor used to say, just like chili con carne is, God, is chili with meat, the incarnation is God with meat, which is like a weird way of framing it. Eugene Peterson, slightly more tactfully, says, and God put on skin and moved into the neighborhood. Further, it tells us that in this reality where God is light, 
Darkness cannot stand against that light. There is no universe where Christ is that darkness can prevail, and it is always cast out by the light of God. Reminds me of the quote from Mr. Rogers. When I was a boy, I would see scary things in the news, and my mother would say, look for the helpers. You will always find people that are helping. There's this reality of what it means that light casts out darkness that we can see now in dark places, which I think is really ideal because everything feels pretty dark, I think, for a lot of us a lot of the time. Maybe individually in our lives, there are dark things happening. When we turn on the news, there are dark things happening. It seems like people that used to be related or friends or family hate one another because of a news channel they watch. The darkness is everywhere. And so to have this picture that says a light shines in the darkness, maybe that's, maybe that's why John writes this intro, this prologue. But I actually think it's even more beautiful as we go forward. In John 12 and thir- verses 12 and 13, he says this, But those who did welcome him, those who believed in his name, he authorized to become God's children, born not from blood or from human desire or passion, but born from God. The result of God's light and our belief in that God is adoption. And I want to do, I've said this before, but I think it is worth repeating. In the first century, people did not adopt babies. Christians actually started adopting babies, which kind of blew everyone's mind. Not a thing you would do. It's weird to adopt a baby if you are a Roman. Because what you would do in adoption, the whole point of adoption is to carry on your name, your authority, and your power. And to adopt a baby to do that would be insane because lots of babies don't make it to adulthood. So to invest resources and energy into creating something to carry on your name that might not make it would be a bad investment. So what you would do as a Roman, if your sons have died or you were cursed with only daughters, sorry, um, if any of those things happened, you would go to a prison, you would find a criminal, and you would adopt them. And by adopting this criminal, who's made it to adulthood, so like significant better chance of lasting a long time and carrying on your name for longer, you would adopt that criminal and they would cease to be. And they would become your son and all the crimes they had forgiven would be forgiven or all the crimes they had committed would be forgiven. All the frameworks around that would be reset. Debts they owed would be wiped away. And instead, they would become your heir. And so we see in this prologue in John, the light has come into the world. God is tabernacling with us. The God who was here in creation, who was with us in the Exodus, is here now. And because of that, we get to be God's children. We get to be adopted into this family, into this reality. We get to be set free from the mistakes of the past. We get to be brought into something new. We get to live in the blessing and the power and the authority and the beauty of all that comes with that. And so what does that mean? I think it actually goes back to the light. Because I think, what is the consequence? What is the result? What is the outcoming of being adopted into Christ? Is that you get to be a light in this world. And that our lights get to cast out darkness alongside the light of Jesus. And when we put our lights together, things get brighter. I think when you look at that Mr. Rogers quote of look for the helping people, as children of the light, children who have been adopted into this God family, we get to go join those helpers and add our light to theirs. And in the places where there are not helpers visible or present, that's where we get to step in. We get to lock arms in community, grab our new brothers and sisters, and seek out darkness and cast it out. Now, we have used metaphors like this before, and some of you have gotten sidetracked by how violent that might sound. I would like to rename again that when Christians seek out violence, we do it with love. When Jesus hunts out darkness, he does it by dying. When Jesus hunts out darkness, he does it by sacrificing and by serving and by healing and by breaking chains and by freeing people and by stitching creation back together. And when we become the light that casts out darkness, we band arms together to find suffering and root it out with love and compassion and care and sacrifice and service and taking all the authority invested in us and letting go of it in the same way that Jesus does 
so that something beautiful happens. The prologue of John makes one really big promise. If you are adopted into this family, light is the unavoidable consequence of it. We have two little kids, believe it or not. You might not know. Uh, The amount of lights that happen in their room at bedtime are shocking. And I can assure you, all darkness has been cast out by the time they close their eyes because there are lights under their bed and lights on their lamps and little lights above them and two lights in the corner that are different colors of red and orange and blue, depending on the day, and everything else. But it's because of that light that they can trust to close their eyes in the midst of the darkness because they know that darkness is actually fading. I think there is this promise. John is the last one published. If John is published, when we think John was published, Jerusalem has fallen. The temple has been destroyed. The sacrificial system has been completely broken. Christians and Jews have been scattered. And some Roman emperor may be targeting Christians because they are not part of an approved Roman religion. Can you imagine then sitting in a room with darkness all around you and a poet gets up and says, where there is light, there cannot be darkness. Darkness casts out light and you get to be adopted into that family now. There's hope. There's promise. There's trust. And there's an invitation for us to participate in it. The church was radical because they were on a mission to cast out darkness. The reason we have adoptions in the early church is because Christians would go out around Rome and the cities that they had churches in at night and collect the babies that had been left out to succumb to the elements because the parents couldn't afford to raise them or because they were girls. And the church would go around and raise them and keep wet nurses with them until they grew up and became grown-ups to the point that Christians were disproportionately women because they saved so many little female babies at the time. There's something radical about that profound light shining into the darkness. And the promise of walking into the dark to go collect babies knowing that light casts out darkness. I think a lot of us have experienced darkness. The promise of John 1 is that light will not be overcome by it. I think we get to participate in that. That's my invitation for us today, to figure out creative ways to participate in the light. Maybe that's serving in family promise this week. Maybe that's being extra kind to a barista who just got yelled at by the person in front of you. Maybe that is listening to your parents' novel idea, you know. Maybe that is acknowledging an unsheltered person as you walk by the street corner, whether or not you have anything to offer them. We get to decide what the light looks like when it comes out of us. But if we are people who have been adopted into this family, we're expected to be the light. Let's pray. Jesus, help us to be your light in the world. Thank you that it is not our job to be your light, but rather your light that comes through us, whether or not we like it. (laughs) Uh, Thank you that it is not our job to fix people or to cast out darkness, but your job as our parent, our caregiver, our brother. Be with us in all of it. Give us the courage and the creativity to do what you call us to. In your holy and mighty name, Amen.